Welcome everybody, last session of the day. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk about improving your skills with the debugger. My name is Bauke Nijhuis. I work for a company called Sync ICT, and I'm from the Netherlands. I would like to start with a little overview. I'm going to talk about three topics, and the first topic is evaluating expressions. So while debugging, we can see the names of the variables, we can see their values, but I want to go one step further. I want to be evaluating expressions. Then the second topic will be hot code swapping. So we're going to change code in a running program without restarting it. And the last topic will be remote debugging. So normally when you're debugging, the program that you are debugging is started in your IDE, but it doesn't have to be the case. It can also be started elsewhere. So everything I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to demo. So we need a little playground in which I can debug, in which I can put breakpoints, in which I can show you stuff. So I created a little program called Hello World. Maybe you heard about it. And uh, it's over here. And if I run it, it says Hello World. It prints Hello World to the console. I added a little twist, so if you provide a parameter, in this case my name, Bauke, it will say hello Bauke, so it will take the name, it will take the value of the first parameter and put it behind hello. So how does that work in the code? Now, actually, it's not that difficult, it's not really rocket science, but here it is. I have a class called hello world. There is one field called default value, which contains world. Then there is main, the entry point of our application. It will print something to the console. And the thing that will be printed is determined by a method called create greeting. And its inputs are the command line arguments. So the method is over here. There's one variable called name, which defaults to the default value, world. And if there is any input, it will update the name variable with the value of the input. Lastly, we use a string.format to create the string, so in case there is no input, hello world, and otherwise hello and then the value of the input. Like I said, pretty simple program. So there's one more thing I would like to explain before we start with the first topic, and that is how do you debug a program in your IDE? Now, that's actually pretty simple. We put a breakpoint somewhere. In this case, I put it on line 14. In IntelliJ, you can just click on the cutter. You can, of course, also use shortcuts. And secondly, you go to the little green triangle over here, and then you press debug. IntelliJ will build a program for you, start the program for you. It will start the debugger and attach the debugger to the program. More about that later. This is how it looks. So in the bottom, we have the debug tool window. On the left, we have the stack trace, and on the right, we have the variables with their values. And in the top part, in the edit window, you see that line 14 became blue, and this is where the execution of the program is paused. And that's everything I wanted to tell you before we can dive in the first topic. And the first topic was evaluating expressions. So, as mentioned before, down here we can see the variables and the values, but I want to go one step further. I want to be evaluating expressions. And the easiest way to do that in IntelliJ is using quick evaluate expression. So you hold the option key, if you have a Mac. Uh, if you have a Windows machine or a Linux machine, you hold the, the Alt key. And then you hover with your mouse over an expression. In this case, I'm going to use string.format. And now I'm going to left click, and IntelliJ will calculate the expression, the outcome of the expression for you. It will evaluate the expression. Um, this is quick evaluate expression. There's also a normal evaluate expression, and it works as follows. You select the thing that you want to follow, and then down here is a little button, or you use the shortcut that's on the screen. Um, but if you click it, a pop-up will occur, and it will pre-fill the expression for you, because you've selected it before you press the button. And if I press Enter, it will evaluate the expression for me. Um, this second method is a bit slower, but it has one big advantage. Because now we can play with the expression. Over here, I can change the expression, put my name there, press Enter, and it re-evaluates the expression. And this is really useful if you know the location of your bug, um, but you don't know directly how to fix it, so you want to try out several fixes. And this is a really nice way to try out multiple fixes in a really short amount of time. So both the quick and the normal evaluate expression are really nice when you only have to evaluate the expression once or twice. If you have to evaluate an expression many, many times, for instance, when your expression is inside a loop, 
this is not going to cut it because you have to click too many times. So in case I have to evaluate an expression many times, I use something else. I use a watch. So how do you create a watch? You select the thing that you want to watch, you right click on the thing you've selected, and then over here you have two options. The first one is add to watches, and the second one is add inline watch. I prefer the second one. I'm going to show you what the difference is with the first one, and I'm going to explain why I prefer the second one. So if I click this, in the bottom it added an inline watch. It shows you the expression and it shows you the outcome of the expression. This is also what would happen if you add a normal watch. But the added value of an inline watch is that it also puts the expression and the outcome over here. And this is really helpful because whenever you are de debugging a really hard problem um, and you're focusing on the code and then you need to evaluate an expression and you have to go down, down here to see what the value of the expression is and then you have to go back to the code, you have to switch focus all the time. And with an inline watch, you can just stay focused on the code and it makes the debugging the difficult problem so much easier. So the last thing I want to tell you about evaluating expressions is about a very special kind of expression, namely a stream. So let me add a stream to the code. I prepared a little stream over here. Um, first I'm going to explain the stream, then we're going to try to debug it with conventional methods. Uh, this is not going to go really well. And then I'm going to show you the solution for this problem. So um, it states it's a simple right shifting algorithm. That means if the input would be ABC, the output would be BCD. So it shifts all the characters in the string one position to the right. So how do you do that in a stream? The first operation is GARS. It takes the string and from the string it creates individual ASCII codes. Then we increment all ASCII codes by one. Then we reverse the operation, so we take the ASCII codes and translate them into strings again, single character strings. And lastly, we join all the strings together in one big string. Explaining this wasn't really hard, uh, it was also not really simple, but it would be, wouldn't it be really useful if we had a more graphical way to see what was happening inside the stream? And that would make it easier to explain. So we're going to try that with conventional debugging means. So I'm going to put breakpoints on the next four lines. And notice when I put a breakpoint over here, something funny happens. It asks me, do you want to create a line breakpoint or a lambda breakpoint? Now, if I use the line breakpoint, it will not give me any new information. So I'm going to choose the lambda breakpoint. Um, let's see what happens. Same thing over here. And the last line is just a line breakpoint. So let's debug this to see if we can get more information about what's happening inside the stream. I'm going to start the debugger. And then IntelliJ pauses at line 21, the start of the stream. So uh, what we can see that we can see that the input is world. We can also see that over here. Um, but nothing new over here. So I'm going to continue debugging. Interesting. It goes from line 21 to 24. OK. Um, still no new information over here. The name variable isn't changed. I'm going to continue the execution. Hey, it is inter interesting. You see? 87. 87 is the ASCII code of the capital W. So that's the first letter in Word. World. Then I'm going to continue again. 87 becomes 88. So this is the increment operator. So this, is, this looks right. Continue again. Hey, 111. That's a small o. 112, the increment. So apparently I only get information about the ASCII codes. Let's finish this. So I've seen this operation, I've seen this operation, but I haven't seen anything about transforming ASCII codes into strings, in single character strings. I haven't seen this line as well, so I think we're missing a lot. Luckily, there's a solution for this problem. And I'm gonna show you right now. So we leave only one breakpoint there on line 21. And if your code passes on the line where there is a stream, this little button over here becomes available. And it says, trace current stream chain. I prefer to call it stream debugger because I think that sounds much cooler. But let's see what happens if I click it. So 
on the top, you see all the operations in the stream. And the first operation was splitting the string in its individual ASCII codes. And that's what's happening over here. Those are the ASCII codes for the word world. Then the second operation was incrementing all the ASCII codes by one. As you can see, all the numbers on the right are one higher than all the numbers on the left. The third thing we're going to do is we're going to take the individual ASCII codes and translate them back into single character strings again. So 88 becomes an X. And lastly, we're going to collect all the little strings into one big string again. So all those little strings collected are this string, this unpronounceable word. So this was really insightful. Now I've seen which values there were and how they float through the stream. So the next time when you have to debug a stream, please use this tool because this makes debugging streams so much more doable. And that's everything I wanted to tell you about evaluating expressions. The next topic is hot code replacement. So I want to change code in a running program without restarting it. But before I'm going to dive into this topic, I first want to tell you something else, uh, which seems to be unrelated, but in the end, there will be a relation. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is dropping frames. So normally when you're debugging, you always go forward in time, right? So you go step, you step, you step, and you go forward through the flow of your program. Um, but actually you can also go backwards. You can also go back in time. And to do that, you have to use something which is called drop frame. Now, let me show you what it looks like. I'm going to start a new debug session. So, the button called drop frame is over here. And um, the first question is, what is frame? And to answer that, we have to talk about stack trace. So, a stack trace is built up out of method calls, right? You have one method calls another, calls another, calls another, and all those method calls are called frames. Um, and you can also see that over here, over here it says frames. So every item in a stack trace is a frame. If I'm going to click this button, drop frame, it will remove the top item in a stack trace. If it, and as a consequence, the execution point of the program, which is currently on line 14, will go back to line 8. The execution will go back to the caller of the current method. So let's do it. Let's just push the button. As you can see, over here the top item is removed. There's only one item left. And up here, you see the blue line moved from 14 back to 8. Debugging-wise, we went back in time. That sounds kind of fancy, right? Going back in time. It's not possible for real, but it's possible while debugging. OK, this is drop frame, and we're going to use that while hot code swapping. So now we're going to talk about hot code swapping. Let me first demo to you how you do hot code swapping. I'm going to stop the debugger. I'm going to restart the debug session. And currently it's waiting at line 8. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change hello in Guten Tag, which is a German version of hello. I'm going to reload the class. There are several ways to do that. But for now, I'm going to right click and click on compile and reload file. I'm going to wait for IntelliJ till it's reload the, the class. And then we're going to continue the execution of the program. And as you can see over here, it says Guten Tag. It doesn't say hello anymore. So we changed code in a running program. This is really nice. And uh, in a minute, I will explain in which situations this is useful. Um, but first, I want to talk about a big limitation to this hot code swapping. There are several limitations, but the biggest one, in my opinion, is that you're not allowed to change code in your current method. Let me show you to you, let me show you to you why this doesn't work. So I'm going to change the breakpoint to over here. I'm going to start the debugger again. And the limitation is you're not allowed to change code in your current method. So this code cannot be changed because the program is currently paused at line 14. So let me show you that it doesn't work. I'm going to change couldn't talk into bonjour, the French version of hello. I'm going to use a different way of reloading change classes because I prefer keyboard shortcuts over clicking with the mouse. Um, I reloaded the program. I'm going to finish execution of the program. And over here, you see, it still says couldn't talk. So we changed the code. We reloaded the class. 
but it did, didn't have any effect. And that's because you're not allowed to change the code in your current frame or in your current method. I just used the word frame, so now you already know where the solution is. You can solve this by using drop frame. So let me show you to you how that works. So, execution is paused at line 14 again. I'm going to change bonjour in hello. I'm going to reload the changed classes. And notice over here, I was a little bit too late, sorry. Um, it, it said before I reloaded the classes, normally it says the name of the method where you're currently at and, uh, and the line where you're at, currently at. So it used to say create greeting, double colon, 14. Now it says obsolete, and that's because you're not allowed to change the code in your current method. But luckily we have this button called drop frame. I'm going to drop the obsolete frame. And now I'm going to continue the execution of the program. And if we look over here, we see hello. So by using drop frame, you can circumvent the limitation that you are not allowed to change code in your current method. And that brings me to the next topic, which is remote debugging. So for remote debugging, now when you are uh, remote debugging, sorry, let me take a sip of water. Normally when you're debugging, uh, the program is started by IntelliJ. IntelliJ starts up the debugger and attaches the debugger. Um, you don't see a lot, you don't see this happening uh, because IntelliJ takes care of this for you. It happens under the hood. But if you look closely at the console, you can see there are traces of it. Over here, this line, this is from the debugger. And the debugger says, uh, that's connected to a VM at a local host and then some ports. So the program is started, the debugger is started, and then the debugger is attached to the program. Apparently this program is listening at some port. So to be able to remote debug, we need two things. We need a running program and we need a debugger that will attach itself to the program. What I'm going to demo you is the following. I'm going to start a program over here and I'm going to tell IntelliJ to connect to that program. So how do you do that? Now, let's start with the IntelliJ part. I'm going to create something called a remote JVM debug profile. We have to go to configurations, and then I have to click the plus over here, and then I type in remote, and then the first hit is the thing I'm looking for, the remote JVM debug profile. I'm going to press enter. I'm going to give it the name, remote devfox UK, and then over here is the interesting part. So this says that the debugger should be attached to a program that is listening on localhost and then on port 5005. So now what we have to do is we have to make sure that this program is listening on localhost 5005. How do you do that? Now, actually, that's pretty simple. We just have to add those command line arguments to the program that we want to remote debug. So let's do that. I'm going to add the command line arguments over here. I need to double quotes, otherwise the shell tries to do funny things with the asterisk over here. And we don't want funny things while doing live demos. So I'm gonna press enter, and hey, look at that, something new happens. Over here, this line is new. So apparently those command line, new command line arguments do something. It made my program listen at port 5005. Unfortunately, this program is so fast, I didn't have any time to attach the debugger. So I have to make one more change. And that's over here. It says suspend is no. I'm going to say suspend is yes. And if you do that, the program starts up, but pauses. The program is waiting for a debugger to attach itself to the program. And once this happens, the execution of the program will continue. So the program is waiting. Let's make sure we're going to attach a debugger to it. So I'm going to press OK over here. And what we just did is just metadata. We just created some information. We didn't really do anything. Now we're going to instruct IntelliJ to use this information to start up the debugger to attach itself to the program in the terminal. So I press Shift Shift. I type in remote the name of the 
configuration. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and um, it's over there, and then I press enter. The debugger started up. Um, it's attached to something. Uh, it says that the input argument is Bauke. And look over here. I also provided Bauke. So I've proven to you that the debugger is attached to the program in IntelliJ. And actually, uh, anything you do while locally debugging, you can also do while remotely debugging. So let's do some hot code. Swapping. So I'm going to change hello into hello, oh, typing, which is the Dutch version of hello. I'm going to reload the change classes. This is not allowed, remember, obsolete frame. Luckily, we have a workaround for that. So I'm going to drop the frame. I'm going to continue the execution of the program and look over here. It says hello instead of hello. So we did remote debugging. While remote debugging, we did hot code swapping. It doesn't get any fancier in this presentation. So I hear you people thinking, but uh, Bauke, uh, you call this remote debugging. You started this program on your local machine. So where's the remote part? Very good question. Let's go back to IntelliJ. So over here, it says localhost. Um, of course, you can also put a remote host in here or a remote IP address. Actually, for real remote debugging, so to a remote server, there are two conditions. The first one, the program that you want to debug has to be open for remote debugging. What does that mean? That means that you have to add those command line arguments, like I just did over here. And secondly, the debugger should be able to reach the program that you want to debug. So there should be a network connection between them, and there shouldn't be any firewalls in between. If both conditions are true, then you can really remote debug. Um, you can apply this technique uh, when you have a problem that you cannot reproduce locally. So you have a problem that you can only reproduce on your production machine, then I would apply this mechanism to get more information about the problem. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. I have a few minutes left, so I can take questions. Okay, there's somebody with a microphone. When you do remote debugging, how does IntelliJ know which sources to display? Does it do an on-the-fly class code? Yeah, class yeah. Byte, that's byte a very good coding? question. Very good question. Um, yeah, in this case, it is pretty simple because the code is over here. Um, I, I, I've, have, I have seen in the past that you could uh, download sources once it was remote debugging. So it does something smart, but actually I don't know how it knows which code it needs. Is anybody in the room that can answer this question? Now, in most cases, you want to debug your own code. So and you just open it up and IntelliJ knows how to... Uh, how to find it, uh, but good question, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I have a question for you. Who learned something new today? Ah, that's great, a lot of hands, I think 80%. Um, this is the end, thank you for, oh, was there a question? Or Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah there's a microphone. Does the, does the streaming and the debugging work with Kotlin? with Kotlin uh, collections? I, I assume this works with uh, anything on a JVM. Okay. So uh, it should also work with Kotlin. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thanks for being here at the last slot of the day. Like I, most people learn something new, so that's really nice. Um, thank you and seeing you at the remainder of the conference. Bye-bye.